Thank you so much for that special music. That was beautiful. <laughs> okay, it's um, time for our scripture reading this morning. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles or look up on your phone, however you're accessing the word of the Lord this morning. Our scripture this morning is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And I am reading from the um, Holman Christian Study Bible. So 12, 7 through 10. So, especially because of the extraordinary revelations, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So because of Christ, I am pleased in weakness, in insults, in catastrophes, in persecutions, and in pressures. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Good morning. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to come before you and worship you. We thank you for the worship that's already taken place, Lord, uh, the opportunity to experience you. And as we get into your word, Father, I pray that you come and teach us, come speak to us. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm still trying to readjust. We just got back from Brazil um, recently. It's actually not that bad of a time difference. We're only three hours ahead there. But still, like, I find myself falling asleep at, like, 8 p.m. instead of, like, 12 p.m. or a.m. And so I'm kind of trying to readjust here. Um, so bear with me a little bit this morning as we, as we talk. Um, as Mitch read in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, um, that being one of my favorite passages in Scripture, um, Paul says the famous statement that my strength is made perfect in weakness, referring back to God and what God does for him. Oftentimes, in a relationship with God, it feels like there are things that separate us from him, but oftentimes, when it comes to our relationship with God, God can actually use those things um, to bring us closer to, uh, closer to him, to fulfill the plans um, that we have um, in him. And that's kind of what I want to share about a little bit this morning. Um, I was encouraged by the baptism that took place this morning. Amen. Yes. Um, such a beautiful opportunity to rededicate our life to God, to commit our life to Him. I remember when I first gave my life to God at Camp Yavapines in Arizona. I, it was a beautiful experience for me. It was a powerful experience. And I just remember sitting in the Alaska room. I remember exactly where I was giving my life to God, and it was life-changing for me. It was powerful. But somewhere along the way, I feel like that experience lost its hold on me. I no longer felt it. Or sometimes I would, I would question, I would, how can I get it back again? How can I experience this again? Can you guys hear me okay this morning? Yeah. Okay. It's like I'm hearing a lot of feedback up here as I'm talking, so it's fine. Um, and anyways, as we kind of go through our Christian walk, as we go through this experience, sometimes it feels like we're kind of just going through it. And, or sometimes the devil tries to attack us, he tries to discourage us, he tries to bring in all sorts of things that feel like maybe they're separating us from God. But in fact, Paul says that God can use those very same things to bring us back to him, to be in relationship with him. You know, sometimes as Christians, um, when we go through our experience with him, we sometimes are told, or we're always told, that if we maintain our relationship with him, we will eventually become more like him. But maybe you're like me in the sense that as you grow on your journey with God, you realize some days 
you're not really like God. Maybe there are parts of you that you wish could change. Maybe there's some things inside of you that um, you, you want them to go away. And like Paul, there's something that's constantly bothering you, something you feel like that's constantly reminding you that you have not been changed, when in fact, God uses that as a stepping stone for change. We went on this mission trip to Brazil, and there was a lot of things that challenged me. For instance, we left from Arizona and we made it to Chicago, and our flight in Chicago kept getting delayed as we were on our way to Brazil. Um, it would get pushed back an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Eventually, we got onto the plane only for them to invite us to get back off the plane. We went all the way onto the plane, and they invited us to leave the plane. We're sitting there, and I was like, finally, we're going to get there. We're going to go to Brazil. We're going to do our mission trip. And as we're sitting there, they were like, hey, we're having some difficulties, and we don't want to right now, at this moment, fly the plane. So they invited us all to get off the plane. That was super exciting. So as we get off the plane, we're like, maybe there's going to be another flight. It just got delayed. It's going to be okay. And the flight was permanently canceled. But all our luggage was still on the plane. That's exciting. And the, um, the airline, I won't say which airline. Try not to be mean this morning. I'm trying to reflect the character of Jesus in all things. Amen. And this airline in particular... The name had an A in it. They, they gave us food vouchers to eat all the airport food you could ever want to eat. So me, I'm excited. I was like, yay, free food. Yeah, well, it wasn't the best food. Uh, but we spent, we, we, we ate tons of food. That was kind of fun. And uh, free food. Yeah, it was, it was lots of fun. Not really. And later on that night, we found out that they were going to get a hotel for us. So we, were, we went to a hotel close to O'Hare. Um, and as we made our way to our hotel, where you know, a lot of shady things happened on the way. We're trying to get a taxi. The cat taxi did not take the airline voucher. This is just like weird things were happening. The guy was rounding up our tip for the trip. And I was like, bro, you're being shady. Pretty sure this is a $40 trip. But anyways, a lot of weird things happening. As we made it to um, the hotel, we got to stay the night there, and I was excited because I was like, okay, we're gonna leave in the morning. We're gonna we're gonna get through this. So we woke up the next morning, praying our flight didn't get canceled, and luckily it didn't. We boarded the plane and we spent the night without our luggage. And as we started wondering where is our luggage, um, we were like, we were told it was in Brazil. Well, that's great, because we still had one more trip to Miami, and my prayer was, I hope we don't also get stuck in Miami. Well, we flew to Miami, and we got stuck in Miami. They didn't even bother delaying our flights. They just straight up canceled our flights this time. They were, they were nicer a little bit this time. Um, instead of keeping us in anticipation, they canceled our flights, got more free uh, airport food, um, so I'm right now going through a cleanse <laughs> to cleanse myself of everything that's inside of me. I ate some questionable things, probably, and uh, we got to visit all the, it was just like basically hung out in the airport. And so and, and all I remember is in Miami, we found out that our hotel was getting canceled, or our hotel, our flight was getting canceled. So they were going to put us up in another hotel, only this time we got almost like a five-star hotel. It was 4.8 stars, so I just kind of round that up, I do math, and we're like, five stars, so I tell everyone we were in a five-star hotel in Florida, in Miami, Florida, and it was awesome. You can see the beach there, it was pretty cool. It was like a resort, they had food, and uh, it was a cool time, but we weren't the only ones. As we were kind of hanging out at the hotel, we discovered that there was lots of people there with us. We actually met another student group who had a campus ministry group from a, another school that was also going to another place doing a mission trip. And we were like, yeah, we're stuck here too. High five. We're in this together. What did Paul say? In all things, I've learned to be content. I've been shipwrecked in this sense, plane wrecked, I guess. And um, we were trying to be content. But we had good students come along with us, so we had, we had a lot of fun with them. Um, I remember specifically while we were in Miami, still we had no clothes with us. So we were like, what are we going to do? Like, you can only wash your clothes and rewear them so many times, I feel like. 
So um, apparently one of us, either Zanika or Alicia, some, they, were, they were in connection with the airlines while Coach Alex and I sat back and did nothing and just hung out, you know, did what we do best, make sure everything's under control as they took care of everything, the logistics. And apparently the airline was cool with us going out and just like shopping. They're like, yeah, whatever you need, go spend, go buy whatever clothes you need. I'm like, about to get a three piece suit. <laughs> Hey, you know, I want to go preach the gospel in another country to look good. Um, like, what is the limit to what we can be spending? And as far as I knew, there was no limit to anything. Amen. Uh, Jesus says, I will, supply, I will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. So uh, our needs were definitely supply, supplied. So later on that day in Miami, we got stuck there that Sabbath. So we went out to the beach and we had worship there on, on the beach somewhere. I don't know which beach, but it was nice. Um, swam in the ocean just a little bit. We had worship there. It was a fun time. And anyways, through this whole process, I'm thinking to myself, man, is this even worth it? Because once we got to the Amazon, it was another 32 hours to the village that we were supposed to be going to. And we were told that we weren't going to be able to get there till Monday, which meant we would get there Tuesday, and we really wouldn't start any work till Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, then we leave Saturday. So I'm questioning if this is even worth it. I'm like, man, maybe we should just get our money back. What are we doing? But again, Alicia and Danica worked out some things, and they got us there um, way uh, uh, more early. Um, I guess earlier, more early. <laughs> English isn't my best language. Um, Portuguese. I can't speak anything clearly. <laughs> Um, and so anyways, we ended up in Brazil, and hindsight, I guess it's 2020, God did his thing because, well, I just kept trying to encourage the students, you know, and be like, guys, look at we're, we're supposed to stay on a boat, okay, in hammocks on the river. I was like, think about it like this, you got free two nights in a hotel, on a bed. You got to shower, like, that's really nice, isn't it? Everyone likes showers. And uh, anyways, when we came, when we finished up the trip, and it was an incredible trip, and we finished it, we found out, or at least I was told, that um, apparently the two days that we missed for the trip, during those two days, our boat got stuck in the Amazon. Apparently the rudder, whatever it is, the propeller fell into the Amazon River, and they had to hire scuba divers to go dive in and get it. So we actually arrived on time at the right time. And thank God's timing is everything because then other than that we would have been stuck in a country with over 80 percent humidity no one wants that and we i don't know what we would have done like they, they did have nice showers at the adra facility but no it wasn't worth it to me i love the i love the drier weather so um god really blessed us he looked out for us and on top of that, Adra is absolutely incredible. They just had an awesome team there that was able to host us and help us. So what happened was, this is what happened. Instead of traveling another 32 hours to another village where we were going to build homes for missionaries there so they could serve there, we went to a village three hours away from us to build, like, hanging gardens. We're going back to our Babylonian days, like these floating gardens, apparently. And apparently, every five to six months in that area, in Brazil, it floods. And you can see on the houses how high the waters get. And so what that does is it completely just eliminates all vegetation there. It gets rid of it. So we were building gardens on these trees, on these logs, cut down a bunch of trees. Apparently, you need a permit there to cut down trees. These guys are just cutting down trees for free. Um, to build these gardens so that way when it did flood, um, the gardens would rise instead of being overcome. So they would have some type of vegetation there um, to eat food. So that was kind of a neat little experience. We got to meet a need there in the community. Now, you know, when I was on this trip, there was zero privacy. You're sleeping, like Coach Alex's feet were in my face every night while we were in We became close buddies. Alicia was like pressed up against me. She was right next to me. Alex's foot was like on my chest in the morning. Like it was like a weird thing. And people were making sounds no human body should ever make. There was zero privacy every night at this thing. And so if you know me at all, um, 
I'm not necessarily, I'm a social person, but I'm probably not the most social person. Oftentimes I like to have my own room, I like to think about things, I like to relax, well I didn't have an opportunity for that. And while we were there, I felt really stressed and anxious because of things that were happening. For example, I was told that I was supposed to preach an evangelistic series. So I came ready with like five, six sermons to be able to preach these series. Well, as I got there, Lucas, who was our coordinator, told us, no, these people don't need to be evangelized to, right? You don't need to evangelize them. Your goal is to simply just build relationships with them, be friends with them. And he said something to me that really stuck out to me. He said, don't think that because you're here to serve them, that you're any better than them. Realize that you are just like them. You're not there to evangelize them. You're there simply to connect with them. And that challenged me because I had this evangelistic series that I felt like I was supposed to, I felt like I was supposed to preach to them. And every night I just started sharing something that I felt like could better connect me and put me in right relationship with them. But it bothered me because I had planned something and this just disrupted for me everything. And I started talking to God and I said, why are all these mean things coming like out of me? Like, if you are with me, like, why aren't you helping me? And this text, this passage from this book called um, Help and Daily Living stood out to me. In it, Ellen White says this. She says, to live such a life, to exert such an influence, costs at every step some form of effort, sacrifice, discipline. It is because that we do not understand this that we are so easily discouraged in our Christian walk. Many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are surprised and disappointed to find themselves, as never before, confronted by obstacles and beset by trials. They pray for a Christ-likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil that could possibly be inside of them. Faults are revealed for which they did not even suspect existence. Like Israel of old, they begin to question, if God is leading me, then why do all these things come upon me? Sometimes in our walk with God, when we think we serve him and walk with him, we think he's supposed to, oftentimes we hope that he makes us just like him, but more often than not, he begins to reveal to us all those things that are hurting us. She goes on to say this, it is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's methods of disciplining and his appointed conditions for succeeding. Oftentimes we just want it. We don't want to fight for it. Oftentimes we don't want have to, we don't want to put in the effort that requires us for us to be able to, to attain it, to have it. Oftentimes, I'm sure all of us have been students, especially for students, we want the easiest route to get it done. Work smarter, not harder, right? But God sometimes has to bring us through it in order to train us, in order to um, prepare us. So this is a cool thing that happened on this trip. As um, I was preaching every night, I was kind of just doing my own thing, doing my own gospel presentation. I was just kind of preaching. And if you know me, I talk very fast, so my poor translator was trying to keep up with me, but every night. And every night, he would come to me and he would say, man, like, that was awesome. That was powerful. And I was like, you're just being nice. Like, thanks, man. I, I appreciate the, um, the, words of, the words of appreciation. And then every night, my translator would pull me aside and we would talk late at night. And he, he began to say, like, man, what you're saying is, like, it's hitting me. Like, this is really responding to me. Like, this sin thing is not what defines me. Like, God has freed me. God is bigger than what my sin is doing to me. And I was like, that's exactly right, man. And we would bounce off stories about each other and talk. And I didn't, sometimes I really didn't feel like I was doing anything. God was literally trying. Like, it was killing me. Well, um, as we begin to leave the Amazon, 
this is, this is a powerful testimony that moved me. Um, at the end of the trip, we were on our boat going back to get ready for our flight. And um, our coordinator organized us all together for us to share our testimony from this experience, to share what we got out of it. And so all the students were kind of sharing, you know, we were sharing, we had a good time, we loved it. And um, my translator, John, he spoke up and he said something that really hit home for me. Um, he goes, you know, when I came on this trip, I, w I, I came because I was trying to get, get away from things. But he was like, coming on this trip and hearing Pastor Zach preached every night, like, that changed me. Like, that did something different with me. And as we began to talk, he was like, I was going through some severe things. I was a student missionary for a year out in this place doing my thing. And as I came back from it, I felt like there was no purpose to life anymore. I didn't really know what I was doing anymore. And he goes, what you're preaching, like, begin to really move me. And what I realized is had I preached that evangelistic series, I wouldn't have connected with anybody. I wouldn't have helped anybody. But as long as I was, as long as I was just me, I was helping people. And I was ministering to them. And I was had the blessed opportunity to um, have a part in changing them. And the crazy thing about ministry and following God sometimes is we feel like there are things in our life that prevent us from doing what the from performing the things that God wants for us. It becomes very challenging and, and, and difficult for us. As a matter of fact, I'm in Matthew 26 this morning if you want to follow me there. Um, this is where we kind of close here. In Matthew chapter 26, some powerful things are happening. Um, the Bible says that Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry and the end of his life. He tells his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 1, they are going to kill me after two days of the Passover, and these guys are going to try to crucify me. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus begins to reveal some not so exciting things. In verse 31, Jesus speaks and says to his disciples, All of you will be made to stumble this night because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Peter, verse 33, answers and says to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be able to, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus prophesied and said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crawls three times, three times, you will deny me. But Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, he says, I will not deny you. So said all the disciples. So, Jesus tells Peter, You're going to deny me three times. If you Read through the story of the prayer in the Garden of Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus goes back to his disciples for the third time, and he finds them sleeping. If you jump to Matthew, um, if you jump to verse 69, the story of Peter denying him, um, the Bible says that as he is following Jesus after he's been taken away, he denies him the three times, and he weeps bitterly because he feels like in denying him, he not only has failed him, but he, feel like, he feels like he is no longer worthy anymore to follow him or um, to continue to do ministry with him. Now, I'm going to skip through this very quickly because we don't have that much time. But in John chapter 21, Jesus recreates this scene. As Jesus is out there, or as Peter is out there denying Jesus, there's a fire out there where he's with the servants. And as the servants begin to ask him, do you know this man? He denies him, claiming he never knew him. He never had that relationship with him. But in John 21, as Jesus revisits him, he creates that same scene for him. There's a fire there for him. And now he's talking to him. And he realizes that Peter had denied him, but three times he calls him back into a loving relationship with him to once again follow him. And what this teaches me and what this shows me is that oftentimes we feel like Paul that what the devil is doing to us or what life is throwing at us this is the thing that's going to separate us. But what we see with the story of Peter and the story of Paul, it's that very thing that God uses to actually strengthen us and to more perfectly perform his will through us. 
Scripture says where sin abounded, grace abounded so much more, it could not prevent us. It couldn't stop us. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, for I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us. We give too much credit sometimes for what we think sin is doing to us. When like Paul, we seem to forget that God can use the devil to grow us. He can use the devil to do something better inside of us. He is an instrument of his. He overcame him, so therefore he can use him. And we get so discouraged sometimes because we feel like the sin that is hurting us is greater than he who is inside of us. But that is not true. He who is inside of us is greater than anything that sin could ever do to us. If death could not hold him, our sin cannot stop him. When Peter was with the servants out there denying him, a few chapters later in the book of Acts chapter 2, he would convert 3,000 people that now came to him. In one moment, he was boldly denying him, but in the next moment, he had the opportunity to proclaim him and to preach him. Oftentimes, we feel like that thing, that thorn in the flesh that's hurting us, we believe that's the thing that's going to separate us, when in fact, God can use it to more perfectly fulfill the plans that he has for us. If God is for us, the Bible says, no one or thing shall ever be against us. We give too much credit to the sin thing. We give too much credit to the devil. Now, this is something interesting I learned in Brazil. Um, when I was preaching, I used the word, I said devil. Like, the devil did this, blah, 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 blah. And my translator like looked at me confused, like scared too. Like, what do I do? I'm like, the devil. And he looked at me again like, uh, I don't know. So he translated, he told me afterwards, he's like, in actually Brazilian culture, we try not to use that term because it insinuates something dark. We kind of stay away from it. We use the title Satan. And I was like, that's super interesting. Because in Hebrew, Satan has a proper place. His name is Satan, Hasatan, in Hebrew means the accuser and the deceiver. First, Satan deceives you to sin, and then next, he accuses you before the Father because of your sin. That's all he can do to you is try to deceive you and accuse you. But the Bible says that God came to free you. Who the Son sets free, you are free indeed. All the devil can do is bully you. All the devil can do is try to lie to you. All the devil can do is try to accuse you. But the devil cannot stop you, nor can he stop what God is trying to do inside of you. In closing, um, I like to share this story. Um, yeah, I, I never really recommend books to people, um, but if ever there was a book I would recommend to you, it would be um, Help and Daily Living by Alan White. Um, my friend Jono um, recommended to me, and it yeah, this book is incredible. It, it's done so much for me. In um, the end of that chapter, I'm going to read to you this segment, this illustration that she uses about trials and how they prepare us and how God's better able to use us. Um, I, um, she uses a story about a bird. Now, I personally hate birds. Here's why. I grew up with them. They're noisy, they're annoying. In the Amazon, you hear them every morning. It, they're crazy. They wake you up. Even Peter, there was a bird, a rooster crowing. We all hate birds, amen. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> growing up, my parents, when my dad remarried my stepmom, Maria, she had this parrot named Petey. We called it the Mexican parrot. It was a Spanish-talking parrot. It spoke Spanish. I can barely speak English, and my parrot can speak Spanish. And Petey was suave, we like to say, with the ladies. Um, he didn't really like guys. He would, If you're a lady, he would come over to you. He would stand on your shoulder and like nibble at your ear. He knew what he was doing. He talked Spanish to you. He, yeah, he, he, he knew what he was doing. Um, and so my parents, when they got married, they're like, well, we need to get uh, Petey a companion. So we bought, we bought him a, this beautiful yellow parrot to go along with them, and they were the most annoying things ever. They would, but they, I'm pretty sure they hated each other. She hated him. They had relationship issues. It was bad. Um, there was a, yeah, it was not good. And on top of that, my, my parents, because they were newly married, they're, they're remarried, they 
they were so lovey-dovey that they went out and they bought two lovebirds and they named one Michael and one Marie. I'm like, get over this, guys. Like, this is too much. Like, too far. I'm gonna, like, make chicken nuggets out of these things. So, I'm, I'm, I'm vegetarian. I support the animals. Um, and so they had two, these two lovebirds uh, named Michael and Maria. And, well, they're called lovebirds for a reason. Um, yes, because they are in love and they make lots of other birds. And so we just had cages full of lovebirds everywhere. And in the mornings, on sunny mornings, when we would try to sleep in, these birds would prevent that. They would stop it. And so we learned that birds actually don't know, like, what time it is. So we would take blankets and hang them over all their cages. And they would think that it's night until we took the covers off. And then they would start chirping and singing again, singing again because it was now morning. So in order to wake up everyone in our family every morning, my parents would undo the blanket so that way the birds can start their singing. Um, but Ellen White gives this, this cool illustration. She says, in the full light of day, and in hearing of the music of other voices, the caged bird will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snatch of this, a trill of that, but never a separate and entire melody. But the master covers the cage and places it where the bird will listen to the one who sings the song. In the dark, he tries and tries to learn the song until it is finally learned, and then he breaks, breaks forth in perfect melody. The bird then is brought forth, and ever after, he can sing that song in the light. Thus God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us, and when we have learned it amid, amidst the shadows of affliction, we can sing it ever afterward. That thing that the devil is trying to use to discourage you, that thing that the devil is trying to use to sabotage you, God is going to use to more fully fulfill his plan that he has for you. Yeah. Paul says his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Not only is God helping me, he's fulfilling right now the plan that he has for me. Yeah.